Good afternoon. My name is Ellen Stofan. I'm the John and Adrian Mars Director of the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. Welcome to What's New in Aerospace. Thank you for joining us, and also thank you to the Boeing Corporation for their support of this event. Today, we'll be talking about the cutting edge in space exploration. So cutting edge, in fact, that our speaker was just honored with a Smithsonian Ingenuity Award for his work in advancing our understandings of the origins of our solar system. Scott Bolton is the principal investigator for the Juno mission, leading the science team on the most in-depth study to date of the Jovian system. The Juno mission to Jupiter launched in 2011 and arrived nearly five years later on July 4th, 2016, and it was worth the wait. Juno is close, closer to the gas giant than any previous spacecraft. It orbits Jupiter every 53 days, passing just above the planet's atmosphere, and even more importantly, peering beneath its swirling clouds. It is revealing things we never knew about Jupiter and changing how we think about the origin and evolution of gas giants. And the pictures Juno have, has returned are breathtaking. We'll take a look at some of these photos a little later and maybe even some of the art that's been created using the Juno photos as inspiration. Before we get started, let's look at a quick uh, video about the Juno mission. In this afternoon's program, we'll get a chance to explore this fascinating mission with one of its biggest champions. Scott Bolton holds a PhD in astrophysics from UC Berkeley and is the director of the Space Sciences Department at Southwest Research Institute. He's worked on many other groundbreaking planetary missions, including Cassini, Galileo, Voyager, and Magellan, and as I said before, is the principal investigator for Juno. I'm personally really excited what he has to say, so please join me in welcoming my friend and colleague, Scott Bolton. Thanks for having me, it's great to be here. So Scott, this is such an open-ended question and it's such a small thing to say about such a spacecraft that's really just totally changed our, our view of Jupiter, but what has Juno learned about Jupiter? Well, Juno has learned a lot of a lot of great scientific, uh, you know, sort of paradigm shifts. We, we, we thought we kind of understood how Jupiter worked and we were gonna go there and take the next step in our lesson. And I think one of the things, the lessons that we learned was don't be too overconfident that you understand uh, from previous missions. So we had sent many spacecraft to Jupiter before, Voyager passed by it, Galileo orbited there. Um, but when we really got up close and personal with Juno and in a unique orbit around the poles, we found out that the deep interior was totally different. We, we went out there to understand whether there was a small core in the center of Jupiter, a small compact core of heavy elements. Maybe it started with rocks collecting and then built around that. Or did it just collapse, sort of like we think the sun did, and there's no core? And it turned out neither was true. There's this sort of what seems to be a partially dissolved core that's a significant fraction of the size of the planet. So right away we were faced with, wow, that's not uh, what either of our theories were. And 
so the theorists had to go back to the, to the table and sort of scratch their heads and say, okay, how does this fit? Um, the deep atmosphere was the same way. We thought it would be well mixed. We'd, ju we'd go there and just below the cloud tops, below the sunlight, where the sunlight shone. We'd have no weather, no meteorology. Everything would be kind of well mixed. If we could measure in there, it would be all kind of homogeneous. Turned out there's huge variations going on deep inside of Jupiter's atmosphere. There's a strange zone near the equator that seems to be more rich in ammonia than everywhere else, and everything's more constant. Um, it's just a completely different world than we expected. The aurora, aurora uh, the northern lights work differently than we thought. Uh, we see these giant cyclones all over the planet. I mean, the weather on it is just amazing. So I think, you know, almost in every facet, um, we learned that our ideas were wrong and we needed to really write a new book on Jupiter. So when I look at an image um, like this, if you could actually have the previous image that was up, when I look at an image like this um, that's been returned by Juno, you know, it's beautiful, but frankly, it looks more like abstract art than the atmosphere of a planet. So help us understand what we're seeing in this image of the atmosphere of Jupiter. So uh, these images are all made by the public, and what you're seeing here is, is basically the storms of Jupiter, um, and it's the first time we got really up close enough to see these. You see this sometimes from previous spacecraft from a distance or Hubble images, and already Jupiter looked beautiful, but when you got up really close, the different colors of the clouds don't really mix completely. It's sort of like oil and water. They don't, you know, or oil paints. They don't completely blend. And you're watching incredible storms. Um, we don't completely understand the, the different colors, what's causing it, some sort of chemistry. But nevertheless, you're watching storms, and these, these winds are blowing hundreds of miles an hour, three, 400 miles an hour, much faster than what happens on the Earth. We have certain kinds of storms where there's huge lightning. I mean, you're basically watching meteorology of a giant planet atmosphere. And while it's similar to the Earth, it's, it's, uh, it's on steroids. Everything about Jupiter is just bigger and, and more powerful. Can you help the audience understand, you know, we had, the Gal we had Voyager that went by Jupiter. We had Galileo that went into orbit around Jupiter. And yet we still have this, you know, my kind of, um, you know, college, high school level idea about the, the interior of Jupiter. What was different about Juno that helped us get this realization, wow, we don't understand Jupiter at all? So, I mean, the general idea and philosophy of space exploration is, you know, look from a distance, maybe through astronomy, then you fly by, uh, you know, like Voyager did, a reconnaissance mission, or Pioneer went even earlier than that, and then go into orbit and kind of investigate the system close up. And what we thought, I think, close up meant was if you got within a few hundred thousand miles of Jupiter, you were pretty close. And, and we would look at the interior sort of by looking at the gravity field and the shape of the planet. And we thought, okay, we got an idea of what it's like inside. We could see the atmosphere swirling around, the bands going different directions and spinning. And, and so it was quite interesting. And we were learning about that. But when Juno approached this, we were trying to take the next step and really investigate the interior for the sake of understanding the origin of the planet itself. And Jupiter is the largest and, and most massive of all the planets in the solar system, so it really represents the first planet. And to understand how that's built, it tells you a lot about the early solar system. Hmm. Was it built like the sun? Did it sort of form by a bunch of rocks collecting? How much water, ammonia? I mean, where, where, how much oxygen is in it? These are some of the fundamental questions. Is there a core? And when we got up close, um, you looked inside at a very different level because you were so close to the planet. So you could measure things. You know, sometimes we would try to make a, the next step in space exploration by moving an order of magnitude in your measurement. We jumped m multiple orders of magnitude in, in by going in so close. And that revealed things that we didn't anticipate. And, and that really was you know, groundbreaking. So when we got up close, the interior just did not look like anybody expected. And, you know, the atmosphere, I mean, I think a lot of people thought it was beautiful. I thought it was a beautiful planet before. I love Saturn too. Um, but when you got up close, it looks like a, an oil painting, like Van Gogh or somebody would paint. And, and in fact, many of the images you see are sort of like Van Gogh's or something. And so I think we learned um, that when you get really close, all the rules are broken, and, and discovery is really fundamental uh, right up front. Well, I think one of the things people are the most familiar with about Jupiter when they think about it is the great red spot. 
Um, and we actually have an amazing uh, video that we're going to play that shows, and here it is. Maybe you can tell us what we're seeing. So, you know, great red spots lasted for hundreds of years, so people thought, well, the roots must be really deep. Well, we had special instruments that could look down and see how deep are those roots. And this video is intended to capture some of that. You see an altitude scale on the left side. We're flying over one of Jupiter's images, and what we're going to mix, one of Juno's images, we're going to mix now the data from below, and as you dive into Jupiter, you see the temperature going up. This was one of the things we were measuring is how high does the temperature go up? And you're going to come out, you went in just below the red spot, now you're going to come out the great red spot. And you can see how the temperature changed very much. And what we learned, which was this video is conveying, was how deep is that great red spot and how hot does it really go? And we found that it goes as deep as we could measure. Um, and it was a surprise. Yeah, that's amazing. So of course, then, as as a scientist, the thing you want to know is, boy, we'd like to go back and go a little deeper because because we clearly didn't get all the way. How does this? How does a planet like Jupiter with these gigantic hurricanes? How does that help us understand hurricanes on Earth? Can is there any comparison, or is the scale just make the physics totally different? No, no, it's definitely comparable, although we don't normally call them hurricanes on Jupiter because the way we think of hurricanes on the Earth, they get their fuel from the water that's right below, and there's no, there's no ocean, so to speak, like there is on the Earth where you land and then but Jupiter's a giant ball of gas. When you go down, it definitely becomes fluid, but it probably works a little bit different than the oceans and the hurricanes that we see. But there are giant cyclones, and there is a comparison there in that those dynamics and whatever physics we use to explain how weather and di atmospheric dynamics work, that general idea has to work at Earth, it has to work at Jupiter, it has to work at Saturn, it has to work everywhere nature is. And so by studying the other planets and looking at what's similar and what's different, you sort of understand better um, what really is the general theory. And Jupiter's storms are unbelievably powerful. And the lightning is really strong there. The thunderstorms are strong. And you can see them in some of these pictures. These are giant storms. This is either a hang glider's dream or a nightmare. <laughs> I don't know which. So each of those circular features we see is an actual gigantic storm. Right. And you can see some of the images where they're connected to their neighbor, another storm. And you know the intersection must be very, very complex. So we have a few images where we've taken them close to try to get the direction of things that are moving. You know which way are we're, we're uh, but we're flying by so fast. I mean, this is another. Picture. This one is stunning. I just think it's stunningly beautiful. But what is it telling us? Like, I, all right, I can look at this as art and be totally happy. But <laughs> what is this bright clouds versus the dark clouds? What are we learning here? So this was a discovery. I mean, we we put the camera on. You know, we all wanted to see what the poles of Jupiter look like and. Um, but we sent back this picture. We were the, the sci whole science team was like, "What is that? <laughs> you know, <laughs> what are those little white things?" And the, we called them pop-up clouds. We could see in the images that sometimes there are shadows that were detectable right next to it. If you blow it up, you can see a dark side we're from the other direction where the sun is pointing. And from that, we could calculate that those pop-up clouds, how, how much higher are they above the cloud base? So what you're seeing is very high up ammonia ice clouds probably sitting thunderheads, sitting above the clouds. In, in some sense, it's sort of what the way Earth works. Nobody expected it. So in the middle of these giant storms and cyclones, they're being fed or they're creating these thunderheads that are around them. They show up as white, which means they're very fresh. They haven't been poisoned by the contamination of the, what makes the other colors, which is mostly chemistry. There might be sulfur and different kinds of chemicals in there that probably make up the colors. So when you see something very white like that, it's very fresh. And so where's the energy coming from to get, to get these? Thunderheads. Basically. So part of this is meteorology. So just like on the Earth, the sunlight heats up parts of it, and you can generate, you know, weather. Um, but Jupiter also has an internal heat source, and it's cooling. It's still cooling off from its formation. So it's warmer in the middle than it is at the top, and it's and that heat has to get out, and and so that has to also be driving a lot of the atmospheric circulation and dynamics. Is somehow that heat has to get out. And my guess is that water and ammonia are playing a big role. Probably water is driving that system, much the way it does on Earth. You know, water, we're, we're used to it. Water falls out of the sky in various uh, ways. You can get snow, hail, 
um, ice, water, rain. Um, we take it for granted now, but in fact, it's really driving our whole weather system. It's doing the same thing on Jupiter. I mean, there's probably big hailstorms. Amazing. So, um, obviously, when, when we think of NASA missions, we, we think about um, scientists, you know, teams of scientists from around the world working on this data. But it's really more than that, isn't it? It's not just the science. How can the public actually get involved with Juno? So with Juno, we, we tried to uh, set up something very unique for the public to get engaged. It, it, we do have a science team, but the camera in particular that has all the images was designed to basically be a public engagement tool. And, and the dream we had was not only would we share images, but the public could come on and make the images. Mm -hmm. They could jump in. And so this is one of the pictures from our website. If you go to missionjuno.com, you'll come to this, you go to the Juno Cam website. And you can see that you can get involved in the planning. Uh, can we go back one? Uh, you can get involved in the planning, the discussion. You can help pick which pictures we take. And then when the pictures come down, you can analyze them either as raw data or you could take a picture that somebody else did and just Photoshop mm -hmm. and then repost it onto the website. And these are examples of some of the images in that gallery. You'll see lots of them. These are all done by amateurs and citizen scientists. Uh, most of these are scientifically useful. Almost everything on there is, is, a, is a scientific useful piece of data or image that many scientists are going in and analyzing. This picture was put out together uh, by uh, another citizen scientist to give people an idea of what it takes to really look at the raw data. So our camera, because we're a spinning spacecraft and we have four different color filters, picks up data in sort of segments of stripes and we build an image as the spacecraft spins past the planet. And so you get a bunch of stripes that you then have to get the timing on and reassemble. So that's if you want to work with the raw data itself and mm -hmm. actually do everything that any Juno scientist would do. Um, however, you can also take a f already made data and just customize it. Mm -hmm. that's a, and a lot of people do that. And then we have a way to repost uh, your, or, or I should say, post your final result up to our website to share it with the public. I love this one, which um, is just fascinating, you know, to take those storms and then kind of blow them outward in such an artistic way. Right. So, you know, we're, we're both big fans of STEAM or STEM education, and I really believe there's an intersection of art and science, which is very important to us all in almost all fields. And here you see a lot of the images, and this is one of them, where somebody posts something that they're inspired in some artistic fashion. There's science in this too. They're taking the swirls and they're showing you in a new way. And, if, and, and, there, and that is exactly how science works too, is I look at a picture from a different way and I all of a sudden see some feature that I wouldn't have otherwise recognized. That's the idea of the original stretch of colors. Mm -hmm. This is more extreme. I'm not sure scientists would do what a lot of the amateurs are doing, but they are gonna start now because we're learning so much right. from it. But it's also just a beautiful picture. And so the next one, and then, I really love this one because it, it's got this historical reflection in it. Right. So, you know, we're all indebted to the incredible work that Galileo did back in the, uh, um, during the Italian Renaissance. And here's somebody that appreciated that. We actually have plaques on the spacecraft, but they took an old document, which was a classic traditional document that's pretty famous, and added a picture um, from Juno onto it. Uh, I like to think Galileo would be proud of this. Yeah, exactly. And this intersection between art and science and culture, obviously that's what we do here at the Air and Space Museum. This one is pretty much a cat, but yeah. This, uh, yeah, the person that put this up, uh, they called it Space Cat, uh, I think it is. Um, but you can see there's a Juno image in it and, and it's been blended in in many ways, different facets, it's very artistic. Um, and uh, my guess is that artist love cats. Um, and I think it's an incredible picture. I think it's really fun. This is another one that somebody was experimenting with just digital art, uh, which of course is very common these days, but they're basing it off of one of our images, playing around with uh, how you would you know, maybe display it. And, and they posted one of these in many, many different colors. This is just one example of them, but they went in and played around with digital art and showed a whole array of the capability of what they were trying to do. I love this one because it really reflects back to, of course, every image we look at is actually made up of picture elements, these little tiny squares of, 
of data that are giving you some information, and this kind of plays with that idea, which I really yeah, love. Yeah, it comes back to basically the idea of a pixel. Okay, excellent. Now this one is actually a piece of artwork that was done uh, by a Smithsonian staff member here at the museum. And I love this because it took that image we were just looking at a minute ago, um, and she did her own watercolor of it, which I love. Yeah, this is incredible. Um, I, I wish I could have done that. <laughs> you know, it's, but this is, uh, you know, a, a true artist who's obviously into science too. Uh, maybe it's a true scientist that's into art. Um, but I think you're exactly right. It's not surprising they work at the Smithsonian. They're already appreciating the art and science link. Um, I think most of us in the world and society and humanity all have that part of us, and it's just uh, great to motivate and inspire. And I'm proud that you know that what we've did with Juno. Not only did we share to the public, but but I see that we've sparked some of that that uh, love of art and science. Well, any teachers who are out there watching today, especially art teachers, I urge you just put some Juno images in front of of, of kids, and I think you're going to see this inspiration because to me. The images, again, I, I think about the science. What are they telling us about Jupiter? But then even I step back and say, wow, this is an absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous piece of art. Now, something that's really fun for kids, but also for all of us, is Juno has some pretty cool passengers on board. And uh, what can you tell us about them? So um, when the mission was during, uh, under development, I contacted the Lego company because I wanted a way to reach out to very young people, right, elementary school students. And um, it's hard to reach them with NASA space exploration. I mean, they're all interested. I give talks to third graders and second graders, and they're certainly fascinated what's a black hole, what's an alien. You know, they ask all these kinds of questions. But I knew they were into Legos. And, um, and so I contacted Lego, and they volunteered to, to join the team. Uh, and they gave us three Legos uh, that were not easy to make because I had, they had to be made out of space grade aluminums because I needed to make sure it didn't wreck our spacecraft. So those are real Lego minifigures. They're the size of Lego minifigures. They're just about this big, around uh, a, a couple inches tall. And there's three of them. One is Galileo, the scientist. He's holding Jupiter in his telescope. And then you have uh, Juno, the goddess, and mm -hmm. Jupiter, the god. And um, they were, they've been a great partner and, and it works. I went into the school with, I had kids, my own kids in elementary school and uh, I took, when they first sent me those, I took them in to show them to the kids before I sent them to the NASA lab to have tested. And um, all I did was walk into the lunchroom with a box that said Lego on it. Nobody knew what was in it. And every kid in the lunchroom surrounded us wondering what, they'd never seen a box that had Lego that came from the company, right? Yes. What's in there, what's in there? They, uh, and while I tried to sell Juno, they were like, let us see the minifigures. <laughs> well, we just want to play with the Lego. <laughs> so obviously, um, for, for you and I, who both worked on the Cassini mission, which ended last year, incredibly sad moment for those of us who love Saturn and were very involved in that mission. Um, at some point, Juno's going to end. And do you have a plan for the spacecraft at the end of the mission? And what science can you hopefully grab out of that? Right, so at the end of any mission, um, especially the outer planets, they now do something they'll call planetary protection, which is uh, not the protection of Earth, but the protection of, um, of the planets and, and uh, the system. So we're orbiting Jupiter. There's moons around Jupiter that are uh, potentially have oceans, and, and we're going to go explore them with a future mission. One of them is Europa Clipper. The Europeans have juice uh, going to Ganymede, but they're going to go explore those and potentially look for life or places that where life could exist. So we don't want to contaminate it. You can't clean the spacecraft perfectly. So the plan is you dispose of it, just like we did with Cassini. You fire the, the, the rockets, and, uh, and you direct the, the spacecraft into the planet so it disposes of it and gets burned up. That's what this is doing. So that'll happen after we're all done with the mission, but before the spacecraft's failed. That's the tricky part, mm -hmm. um, because we're under high radiation, so we have to monitor, make sure the health is okay. Um, but at the very end of the mission, we'll go into the planet. Right before we go in, we'll try to take data, because you're gonna get really, you're, we're close already, just a few thousand uh, miles above the cloud tops, but we're going to get even closer, obviously, and we'll try to get that last bit of data sent back, and, as Cassini did, and some of it's the most valuable data you can get. 
Okay, that's, it's excellent. It's sad to think about, but, but to me, grabbing that little bit of close in science is, is always gonna be fun at the end of the mission, but you have so much more science to do before we get to that point. Um, I'm, I'm still looking forward to what's next, especially this really intriguing question of, of uh, how we push our understanding of what the interior of Jupiter really looks like. We do have an online question uh, that we can take. Um, and so I'd say the question is, what else do we hope to learn from Juno? So as you're sitting there and your team is thinking, what are we doing this year? What are we doing next year? What's the science upcoming that you're really focusing on getting? So we're about halfway through the mission. So, so what Juno is is, an, uh, is a mapping uh, mission. It, it, it flies over Jupiter 30, 32 times, and each one is over a different longitude. So if you were mapping the Earth, you wouldn't want to fly over New York over and over and over again, or Washington, D.C. You'd want to go over New York, you want to go over California, you want to go over the ocean, all these different places. So that's what we're doing. So halfway through, we've basically made a map that's kind of coarse, and the next half of the mission, which starts pretty much next year as, as, uh, as we get there, um, we'll cut that resolution in half and make it, or go twice as good, and, and so we'll, make the map more precise, which will answer some of the most fundamental questions about what's inside, the magnetic field, the gravity field. We'll also be going over new territory with the microwave, so we'll look inside the atmosphere deeper, we'll study the aurora more. We're also exploring the magnetosphere. So as we go close to Jupiter, the rest of our orbit is far away from Jupiter, but we're studying the whole magnetosphere, which is Jupiter's got a giant magnetic field, and we're studying how that works and how it interacts. And as time goes and Jupiter moves around the sun, you're exploring new areas of that region and territory and that we've never seen before. So there's a lot of new things that are going. Um, one of the most exciting things that'll come up next year um, is we're going to spin the spacecraft in the opposite direction from what we normally spin. So we normally spin um, sort of where we make a stripe across longitude and we fly over and we're gonna spin it sideways so that we stripe across latitude mm -hmm. and we're going to look on inside the atmosphere with our microwave instrument which is what gives us our deep our view of the deep atmosphere and we're going to be able to make sort of a 3d map that we've never seen before now that's some of the most puzzling data that we have is the deep atmosphere and the fact that we're going to turn it sideways I can't tell you what we're really going to see because I don't know, and I've been so wrong up till now, I'm hesitant to guess now, but I know that it's going to open up our eyes in a new way because it's like a whole other kind of instrument when you spin it the other way and we dissect the planet sort of sideways or perpendicular from what we have. So there's a lot of elements of discovery coming from that. And uh, so we're very excited about doing that. There's other special opportunities where we go over the great red spot and we'll search to see if there's a gravity uh, lump of mass underneath it, which will tell us more about how deep it is and what's creating that great red spot. And then finally, toward the end of the mission, our orbit moves and we get closer and closer to the poles. Mm -hmm. And those giant polar cyclones are a big mystery and we're gonna be able to see how deep those go. What are they like underneath? And we, right now, we're too far away from the poles. We have to wait till the end of the mission as the orbit twists due to Jupiter's gravity field. We'll get a better view. Awesome. I think what we've heard today is how much more we have to look forward to from Juno. I, I can't wait to, to see what they do next. I can't wait to see where this art uh, is going for. And I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. And that's it for today's What's New in Aerospace. Thank you once again to Boeing for their support of the program and to Scott Bolton for joining us today. Thank you, Scott. Thanks for having me. Great to be here.